Hello, folks, and welcome back to English 403 503 with me, Dr. Matt Barton. Uh, in this lecture, we'll be talking about this article by Alex Reed about blogging. Of course, we'll also link that to your uh, uh, social media project. I have a video in here uh, from the author of that book on flow. It's a TED Talk, actually. I think you'll really enjoy that. Nice and short and uh, well produced as TED Talk videos tend to be. Uh, then I've got a little personal story about blogging. And uh, you know how you might actually make some money with it. It's kind of exciting. Uh, it might be a step towards your writing goals, your career goals. We've got a lot of fun stuff to cover here, so let's get started. Um, yeah, here we go. And I thought maybe just to, just before we uh, dive into the article, I'll ask a quick question. Uh, and the question is, have you ever blogged before? And how did that go? Or if you if you haven't blogged before, you know what are your thoughts about the process at the moment? So just take a few minutes to fill me in on that, and then we will continue. All right, so you're back. That's wonderful. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, so this article, and I should say that one of the reasons I am kind of a fan of this collection to kind of jump ahead to the when we get to the lesson. Lessig's book about free culture is that these are materials that are freely available. They're it's called open education initiatives and things of this sort. So there's kind of a little bit of a rhetorical purpose to choosing to use these books, you know, and these materials over say something that would, uh, you know, have a price tag attached to it. These are uh, professors like Alex here and myself. You know, I contributed to this collection as well. But the idea is to you know, hey, we're using this kind of stuff in our classes anyway. Why don't we just put it online somewhere, uh, have it professionally edited or uh, peer-reviewed and all this sort of thing so that we can use it in classes and save uh, students some money. And so there's a little bit of a, you know, that's a little bit of the behind the scenes uh, with this collection. So you might, you know, find that you really like that concept and uh, want to contribute something yourself. You know, particularly if you're a graduate student, you might want to get involved uh, in this initiative. I know the editors quite well. Uh, of this uh, project. But, but anyway, let's get back to blogging. Uh, so he starts off here talking about uh, Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, it's a really, really good book. Uh, I've read it before, although I'm blanking on the name. Maybe he talks, maybe, let's see, does he give the, uh, let's see what's the name of that book. Outliers, yes. Uh, the Story of Success. Really good book. You can pick that up on Amazon. I highly recommend it uh, for anybody, really. But uh, one of the key concepts in there is that you need about 10,000 hours to really get good at something, you know, hit that sort of level of uh, competence, high competence. And I think the examples in there include people like Mozart, uh, you know, basically people that get got started, if you know about Mozart, uh, the composer's uh, biography, his personal history. He was actually uh, musically trained and musically talented at a very, very young, you know, basically a child, you kind of imagine like a toddler with a little, uh, you know, one of those little uh, toy keyboard, toy pianos, you know. <laughs> you know, as it got started really young, so really by the time he's, uh, you know, in his 20s and certainly by the time he's in his 30s, he's like doing really, really good uh, good work. But, you know, Gladwell's point is, you know, everything is more or less like that. Uh, we always want to uh, just jump in and sort of have beginner's luck and, and think that it's going to be uh, you know, a relatively short process to you know, hit those high levels. <laughs> Uh, when, of course, if you just haven't put the time in, uh, you're not going to get there. And it's very much true of the reason uh, Reed's talking about this here is that this is the same as true for writing. Uh, a lot of uh, you probably are creative writers or at least dabbled in that. Uh, a lot of English majors tend to gravitate towards that topic. Uh, but simply because it's something that you, uh, you know, enjoy doing as a kid. You know, small kids, you gather around, you're writing stories. Uh, you may have even have written uh, stories and sent them in somewhere to try to get them published. Uh, at the very least, you had stories around the campfire, told your parents or friends stories. So you kind of got started, you know, really young uh, with this interest in writing. And, and of course, you had the, uh, uh, you know, contests and prizes and, and things of that sort, maybe. Uh, but the point is, you probably put in a lot of hours uh, to get to the level where you are now. It's kind of curious. Maybe you can do a little mental math and try to figure out, you know, how many hours does that entail. Uh, but it's sort of outside that, you know, phenomenon. A lot of students, they don't really do that much, uh, 
writing for fun, right? Or, or writing with a specific goal of trying to improve uh, their writing. It's a little curious. Let's see, when was this written? 2011. So I guess that was, you know, well after Twitter and Facebook. So a lot of people are writing in those uh, sorts of venues. But I would uh, argue that there's a difference in getting, like, really good <laughs> writing a whole lot on Facebook or Twitter. <laughs> you know, is that really the same style of writing that you feel like you would need to be successful at, at a workplace? You know, for example, uh, writing uh, grammatically, you know, correct sentences, writing with a, a certain style beyond... Uh, you know, you know, memes and that sort of thing. So it's, it's probably very much true what he's saying here. Yeah, or unfortunately, often the trappings of a school curriculum can interfere with our ability to connect writing to our own goals and interests. Right, so you might know what it takes to get an A in, a, in class, and you know, kind of make that the goal. I want to get an A on this essay. And you say, well, what's the word count need to be? You know, and how many sources? And basically, you're more worried about a grade outcome than like genuine interest in improving yourself as a writer, learning that craft of uh, excellent writing. Um, you're not, you know, this, this part about the punishments, right? You, like you're really afraid of getting a bad grade on an essay or, or whatever the case may be. So you're more worried about like the negative side than the potential rewards. That means you're probably not going to take as many risks. You know, this has been psychologically shown you know, and, and everything from investing to uh, write, write it, writers uh, taking risks, you know, any kind of risk-taking exercise. If you, a lot of people will be stymied because their their fear of the punishment or their fear of doing badly, uh, the pain of that uh, far outweighs the potential uh, pleasure, you know, that they might get if, if they do well. Uh, so a lot of people, they won't even try something or they won't take any risks, even if there's a good chance it might turn out well because they're, again, too afraid of the uh, the negative side. So you, you want to try to uh, get beyond that because, you know, being a really good writer, you know, of course, of course it means you've got to take some risks. You've got to do some things that, you know, haven't necessarily been done before. you got to try new things. you got to adapt, evolve, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, what's he saying here? For good or for bad, there are not likely to be many extrinsic motivations you know, in the extrinsic, uh, yeah, like money, <laughs> there's the example, uh, for your blogging, so your only reasons for continuing to blog will need to come from inside. Uh, yeah, so it's kind of hard to get paid to blog. Um, there are motivations like getting uh, likes, getting a thumbs up, you know, he talks about that in here, but just coming back to the subject of money, uh, I want to give you this little personal example of a blog that did pay money, at least for me. This was uh, a blog I did back in 2006. We had this blog called Armchair Arcade. It's just a couple of guys, I think maybe three or four guys, uh, doing this kind of a retro computer game, retro video game type of site. And we were just writing these sort of articles basically for fun, just because we liked this stuff and, you know, we liked to. I think the comments are still there. Kind of like the chatting with people of like minds. It's just kind of a hobby project. Very nerdy one. <laughs> uh, but anyway, again, just doing this for fun, right? Uh, but what ended up happening was a uh, an editor of this website called Gama Sutra, which is a commercial site. You know, these guys publish uh, resources for uh, game development. Uh, anyway, one of the editors saw the article on this armchair arcade site and he said contacted me and said look I'd like to uh, I'd like for you to uh, write for us you know can you take your this blog you did uh, for that other site and we'll pay you uh, to do it and we'll you know have it professionally edited and we can put it on our Gama Sutra site so I think I got maybe a couple hundred bucks you know for this and up doing a whole series and it got a lot of a uh, lot of attention uh, from this and and from there uh, believe it or not a book editor uh, was looking at these articles and said, you know, I think this would make a good book. Uh, so just, a, again, out of the blue, this editor uh, of, uh, I think it was A.K. Peters contacted him and said, hey, can you maybe expand on these blogs and uh, turn it into a book? You know, we'll publish the book. You know, so I, you know of course, you know, I made so, a little bit of money in, on every step of, of that journey. Uh, so I'm not trying to say this, you know, to brag or anything, although it's, you know, I'm certainly proud of this. Uh, you know, it was a lot of hard work, but you know, again, just the point is, 
you never really know uh, what might happen. You know, so I just say, if you if you're curious, if you like writing about a topic, if you're passionate about something, and I, you know, how nerdy can you get, right? Than <laughs> old computer role playing games, you know, and yet good things happen. So I always just say, you know, if you just just try it out, you know, put it out there. It doesn't take that long, and if it's it doesn't seem like work if it's something you enjoy writing about, right? So uh, go for it. Okay, uh, what else has he got in here? Defining blogs is difficult. Yes. You know, with any of these articles, they, they always seem to assume that the most important thing is to try to nail down a definition. I even did that in that Dungeons and Desktops book. Like, what is a computer role-playing game? And it's kind of fun, I guess, philosophically speaking. You know, trying to uh, nail down a precise definition. But it hardly ever works out very well, so... And usually I just <laughs> skip over that section. You know, we kind of know what a blog is by reading lots of blogs. And it's the more you try to come up with a definition, somebody's going to disagree with it. Uh, anyway, he's got a sampling of popular blogs here. And since this article was a little bit older, I thought it would make sense to look at some of the more recent uh, lists of this sort. And here's one from Wix blog which, by the way, is an alternative uh, to WordPress. I believe this is also free. You might be able to buy some professional templates or something. Uh, so there's a little updated info. It says there's over 600 million active blogs on the Internet. So 600 million that people are regularly contributing to, and, of course, it still includes just personal stuff, now all the way up to, uh, you know, ones like that. You know, for professional game developers, a lot of them are kind of like journalism news sort of sites. It kind of, uh, you know, again, thinking about defining a blog, sometimes it's hard to say, this is a blog, this is a news source, news site, you know, whatever you want to call it. Uh, there tends to be some overlap there. Uh, just as long as I'm thinking about this, there's a site called Game Banshee. Yeah, and this is a, I come across these guys, they would post about my computer role-playing game blogs, but this is a blog, and it's the reason I bring this up, it's run by John Birnbaum out of, Min out of Minneapolis. He's in the, he's Minnesota-based, and I've often talked to him about, you know, internships, you know, so if you're interested in this, <laughs> this sort of, uh, this sort of stuff, uh, you know, enough to want to get an internship or maybe work uh, uh, for John, uh, you could certainly, uh, we, could, we could look at that. But anyway, back to the topic. Uh, so they have, um, 20 types of blogs that they say are the best types to create. Look, you got food blogs, travel blogs, health and fitness blogs, lifestyle lifestyle blogs, uh, and so on and so forth. I'm kind of surprised that political's not on here. You think that would? Well, that's all we got at number 20. <laughs> uh, religion blogs. Oh boy. Uh, sports interior design. Really, there's a lot of stuff here. Now, I'm kind of curious if we click there, what, what do we get? Do they tell us, like, what which ones are the most popular? Uh, food blogs come in special flavor. Oh, pff, hardy har har. <laughs> um, let's see. Foodies. Many foodies have chosen a specific blog niche to stand out, such as wild plant food, which specializes in 100% uh, vegan recipes and this is kind of the key thing a lot of people when they start out they want to be really general with their blog you know you might say oh, I just want to blog about video games you know it's kind of this big general topic it's too big you know, if you can identify some kind of niche you know maybe you don't have a massive audience uh, but at least you know there is an audience I mean there's certainly people out there that would be interested I think in a hundred percent vegan recipes so that would help set you apart from that you know, 600 million uh, they were talking about. So this is probably just, you know, recipes. Let's see if there are any kind of uh, commentaries on these recipes. Yeah, this looks like just straight up recipes. So for me, this would be a little bit less, less interesting as an example, because I like to see at least a little bit of writing. <laughs> Remember, we're trying to find, uh, you know, this site, this, this blog would be better, I think, if they talked a little bit more about why, maybe. You know, if they had some posts on here about why a vegan lifestyle is desirable or why this might be something to to try. I don't know too much about it, but anyway. 
So those are the categories. And then over here is the, I found an article called the top 10 blogger influencers for every industry. And the, an influencer, you know, one way to think about that is just this, these are the rhetors, right? These are people using rhetoric. Uh, they're persuading people to do, to buy certain things or to, uh, again, to maybe be a vegan instead of a, <laughs> a vegetarian. I don't know. Uh, but they're, they've got some kind of uh, rhetorical angle to what they're doing because they're influencing people uh, to go this way instead of another, you know, and so on and so forth. And so we can see here travel, beauty, a lot of the same categories. Uh, fitness, lifestyle, do it yourself. Let's try the uh, travel blogger. See what we find there. Natalie and Murad Osman, founders of the Follow Me Too on Instagram. They don't just travel to amazing places, they engage local thought leaders, activists, and celebrities. So this is getting closer to what I have in mind for you all with your blogs. Uh, I like that idea about engaging with the thought. <laughs> you know, instead of just, here's some pictures of, you know, uh, San Francisco. You know, you're trying to get beyond that. And, uh, let's see, there's an interview. What is this? The Colorful, colorful Glory of Los Angeles. Yeah, okay, so now we're getting into some writing. The Arts District is the perfect starting point for your immersion into this mind-blowing, sun-soaked world of L.A.'s street art. So I would argue here is an argument. Right? This is this is like rhetor This is rhetorical. They're saying, look, this would be great. Don't you want to come here? Here's some good reasons why this is a... Uh, it's worth checking out this, uh, uh, this district, in this case, uh, to look at the street art. And then they have these pictures to kind of uh, support that argument. You know, you're supposed to look at this, I guess, and say, well, that looks pretty cool. <laughs> I'd like to go look at that in real life. I'd like to go visit these uh, sites. So, yeah, this is a much better example, I think, for, for you all. And you can see just how much writing there is. And I haven't actually read this, this piece, but I'm sure, to, <laughs> since it's number one, <laughs> I'm sure we can... Uh, I'm sure we would find that it's well-written, descriptive, and all the traits of uh, good writing. Uh, on this uh, on this blog, so let me just get the name of that again. Um, Murad Osman. Okay, and then finally, here is uh, Alex Reed's blog. <laughs> I showed this a little bit last time, uh, but I'm just I'm so impressed. You know, if you look at this article again, you know where he's showing you his website. Uh, where is it? He talks a lot about banner images. Yeah, look at this. Look at how far he's come from this. What was this, 2006 or so? You know, that looks very 2006. <laughs> you know, here we're, boom. You know, this looks very modern, very hip. He's got his nice, colorful photo there. I'm kind of intrigued by this. Looks like a craft work video or something. Computer vision, radical media, archaeology, and post-humanism. They click this nice, nice, you know, photo kind of, kind of a piques your curiosity a little bit. And you're like, what, what's what's this thing? <laughs> what, what, what's going on here, right? So you kind of get curious. So you click on it and you, you start reading and you hopefully have a snappy intro, a little bit of uh, Alex's personality, his interest. And you can see this is not really academic. You know, he's an academic. I'm not saying that. I'm <laughs> just saying his writing style in this blog uh, I would argue it's a little bit uh, less formal. Right? He's got how many? Hmm. You, know, you probably wouldn't see that in an essay, <laughs> you know, formal uh, academic essay, but, but it's okay here in the blog. Uh, nice short paragraphs. He's got links in here so you could read more about AI. He's got some, he mentions articles, books. I uh, love Manovich. He's a pretty popular uh, author about new media, digital media. So it's not that this is not thoughtful or not academic per se, but it's just a slightly different style. Something more readable, suitable, I would argue, for a more general audience. Okay, let's see what else he's got in here worthy of attention. Uh, yeah, it's not particularly useful to try to understand how to write in any general way. Instead, think about the particular writing practices at work that you face as a writer. Who is my audience? What do they expect from me? What do they already know about the subject of the text I am composing? 
how will they react to my message? And so this one here is the reason why it's this first point. You know, it's why it's so important to have an audience in mind. You think about a target audience. You know, if you if you wanted to do, say, a, a, I don't know, something about, let's say, hunting, and you said, I want to just think about maybe Minnesota, uh, hunters in Minnesota. You know, that's a pretty specific audience, and you can start thinking about what makes those that set of uh, hunters different from hunters in <laughs> even Wisconsin, but, you know, certainly uh, in other countries or down south somewhere. And then you might start thinking more about uh, things like uh, uh, hobbies, that other interests they might, might share. Uh, typically, I just always start by thinking about what would I like to read? And, you know, I know there's other people out there like me. <laughs> Hopefully not too many, but, you know... Uh, you know, so if you write something that you would like to read, you know, chances are that you'll have an audience that way. Uh, but again, if you're part of a hobby, uh, if you go to conventions, conferences, if you go to uh, festivals and things, you, and talk to the people there, like-minded people, you can learn about the sort of things that they enjoy reading and uh, take it from there. Let's see, too, what is my purpose? What is the exigency for this text? What, made, what motivates me to write the text? Uh, so for me, with those blogs I was talking about earlier, I was kind of just genuinely curious about, like, what came, what is the history? What were these early games like? I thought it would be fun to uh, kind of almost be like a historian, you know, kind of like digging in and, and sharing that info, learning things. Uh, that was interesting to me. Uh, but you might have different motivation. You know, a lot of people enjoy teaching, providing a, educational materials online. Maybe you don't want to be up in front of a classroom teaching uh, students, but, you know, if you know a lot about a topic, uh, you know, maybe you know a lot about... I like to watch all these uh, survival shows on Discovery and History Channel, like the... Uh, <laughs> it was a Naked and Afraid. <laughs> and a lot of those people on there are instructors, right? They So the, what that means for them, they probably have a YouTube channel where they're demonstrating things, or they have a, a blog uh, where they're blogging about it. Uh, so I'd say they're probably motivated by that desire to uh, to teach others, right? And maybe help them out of a sticky situation if they ever find themselves in one. Uh, three, what is the genre in which I am writing? What are its conventions of fairy tales? How are arguments made in this genre? What type of evidence will be found convincing? So this is another key component. Uh, in when, you, uh, when we're looking at Alex's blog... You know, I said, look, he's quoting there, he's, he's referencing Wikipedia. <laughs> okay, so that would probably motivate people, or that would be fairly convincing for his audience, because they're, again, computers and writing community. We uh, tend to like Wikipedia, we're not, we don't tend to be real cynical about it like, like other people. But he also had a quote in there from uh, Lev Manovich, very respected book author, scholar, uh, academic about new media. So he's, he's bringing in, like, these uh, respected authority figures and to help bolster his arguments about about AI. Now that's now again coming back to the survival blog. If you're doing <laughs> some type of a you know primitive survival uh, blog, I would say they're probably going to be less impressed with it. If you're quoting Wikipedia for everything in there, they'd probably be less impressed with that. Probably be more impressed, I would just guess, uh, if you had say a, a video where you actually were demonstrating like here's how to make a fire with a bow drill. <laughs> <laughs> you actually could show that you could do that uh, on the video. Uh, that, to me, would probably be better evidence uh, than just quoting somebody you know, that talked about bow drills. You know, just kind of a quick, quick example off the top of my head. Uh, let's see, what else is in here? Yeah, he's got Daniel Pink, another good uh, author. Writes a lot of, I think he's a linguist, right? Talks a lot about the brain and, and language. Very... Uh, Gets frequently mentioned in these um, at academic conferences, especially in computers and comp. Uh, but he's got uh, four elements of autonomy, task, technique, time, and team. So he says here that the task was to, uh, I guess, just write the blog and decide on the subject matter. Uh, typically, people will set themselves up a time. And let's see, a technique. I decided I would write in a quasi-academic style. That's just the technique component. Uh, at the time, he says he would just do it when he wanted to. You know, some people, again, like to have a certain time of the day they write. A lot of the creative writers who uh, that I've read over the years that talk about 
this topic. We'll say they like to get up in the morning when it's nice and quiet and do their writing. Uh, but the important thing, and he talks about this too, is just to have a routine. Right? So you want to just get into a habit of writing at a certain time, and then it'll be, again, less weird, less like work, and it'll just seem natural to you uh, to be writing. I always do my best work in the morning, no question. And then the team, he decided to write his own blog, but you know, some of the other blogs I've been a part of were teams. You know, we'll talk about uh, Kairos, the journal, which was started by grad students as an online academic journal, but they had a blog for a while called Kairos News. And uh, I got involved in that. I was one of the bloggers, part of a small team, and it really, really helped because the it was uh, other grad students on this blog when I started out. Uh, but of course, eventually we all got uh, PhDs and landed positions, and now we're, you know, still friends, and we can uh, basically part of build up a social network. Uh, but it was great, you know, to get to meet all the people associated with Kairos and, and Computers and Composition Journal. And you know, wouldn't ever had that opportunity if I hadn't decided, hey, let me, I'm going to try this. You know, what, what do I have to lose? I'll blog a while for this Kairos news and see how it uh, see how it works. Yes, and that's a much better motivation than just thinking about the classroom context only. And that will definitely limit you if the only time you write is when you're required to for a class. Because that feels a lot more like work uh, than it does. You know, it's a very different experience when you're doing it for pleasure and when you have some other motivation uh, than just because of a grade. So hopefully you'll <laughs> get, try to get beyond that attitude as soon as possible. Uh, yes, reading other blogs, this is also key, uh, really, really key, I think. Not just for blogs, I would argue for anything you want to do. Uh, you know, and unfortunately, I work with people all the time, and they tell me, well, I don't want to read other blogs, or I don't want to read other game reviews, or I don't want to play other people's video games, or I don't want to read other novels or poems, or whatever the case may be, because it will affect my originality, right? It will influence me, and I won't be, you know, as unique as I was before. You know, it's just, I was just, that's ridiculous. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, get, get over that. That's the worst possible attitude. Uh, instead of that, you should be actively reading, uh, again, yeah, wide range. Really try to get a feel like what's out there. Who are the most respected uh, bloggers in, the, in this niche, but beyond the niche? You know, what are they doing? Uh, how do they write sentences? You know, how do they uh, format their paragraphs? You know, and the more us, the better the sense. Now, I'm not talking about just reading them for pleasure. I mean, like actually reading them as a writer. Uh, so you're actually like closely looking at the structure of it. You know, asking yourself, could I maybe adapt that technique there? <laughs> kind of like the, you know, the way that they are opening up these blogs, or like that style. The, you know, a lot of this stuff. I'm not saying copy it, uh, but you can certainly adapt it uh, for your own use and, and apply it. And I, mean, I do that all the time. You know, my YouTube channel. You know, I like to look at the sort of the hit YouTube celebrities, you know, the, the big stars. And, of course, <laughs> it's, not, it's not the goal to become them or to become their clone. Uh, you just want to get ideas from them uh, that you can take and apply uh, to your own projects. And, yes, definitely true with blogs. He also talked in here, I don't know if it's in that spot, but uh, about commenting on other people's blogs or when you're blogging, reference, refer to other blogs. You know, same thing with YouTube channels. You know, if you have a YouTube or Twitter feed or anything like that, if you're constantly uh, referring to other people, you know, and within, in the case of Twitter, you know, of course you want to include their, uh, you know, their, their Twitter handles when you when you tweet something <laughs> or replying to them. Uh, but what happens? Uh, you know, same thing with YouTube. Uh, what tends to happen is uh, they'll notice that, and sometimes they'll follow you in return, and they might reply uh, to something that you write, and then you'll pick up a lot of uh, followers that way. You know, people that wouldn't, they would not, they, nobody would just randomly stumble across your blog. Uh, but since they see it, since you've been commenting somewhere else, they might say, well, that's a, that's an interesting comment. You know, who is this Barton? <laughs> oh, Barton has a blog too. Well, maybe I'll, uh, you know, click over and see what, what that's all about. Uh, so it's kind of this way to get, you know, sort of networking, basically, in a, in a nutshell, that's what it's all about. Uh, you require sufficient exigency to write. Where does this come from? An urgency to the subject matter. An important and reasonable purpose. Yeah, writing a job letter to get a job. 
or you might be thinking of a building up my personal credibility on a topic, you know, sense of authority, feeling qualified to write about a subject. Maybe you perceive a, uh, a lot of myths or erroneous information out there about something that you happen to know a lot more about, <laughs> and that can be a pretty powerful motivator. A uh, strong personal interest, an audience that will give you positive feedback. This is another big motivator. Can be a demotivator if you don't get the likes, you know, <laughs> the thumbs up. Uh, but it's always great, isn't it, when you when you post something and you get a lot of uh, you know people saying this is really great. I really enjoyed this, or you know, thumbs up or five stars or whatever. You know, to me, it always gives me that little bit of extra motivation to try to make it a little bit better, because I really prefer the uh, positive comments. All right, I'm forgetting where he put the stuff in here about flow. So just before I forget about it, well, I think I just saw it. Uh, yeah, here we go. He talks about this concept of flow being important and creating a flow state and all this sort of thing. And so I have a little video here, a TED Talk by uh, the author of this book, uh, this concept of flow. So watch that and see if you can figure out what flow means and then uh, come back and tell me what you think about the concept. Okay, and I think that'll pretty much do it for us. Some of this other stuff you can apply on your own. I find this useful just to experiment with fonts. You know, sometimes you get stuck and you don't know what to write, kind of get writer's block. Sometimes just switching to a different font can sort of wake your, your brain back up again and give you some, uh, some juice to keep going. Uh, we're running a little bit short of time here. I don't want to go on for too, too long. I mean, commenting, though, is something that comes up a lot. You might get some negative comments, some... Uh, hateful stuff in addition to just the spam you know it's easy enough just to do, uh, delete spam you know you probably won't have a, you probably won't have any issues like that since we're using St. Cloud State logs you know if you go beyond that just into like a general environment or you start posting stuff to YouTube it can you know certainly happens to me from time to time uh, there's always this question you know, should you delete something should you block somebody you know I kind of think about it just in you know, I don't know if there's like a one-size-fits-all solution there. Uh, I just think about it basically in terms of my own mental health. You know, if there's somebody there that's just, you know, if I'm, if I'm reading their comments and it just kind of bringing me down, you know, you, you don't know, you know, life is too short, right? I would just uh, block it uh, or delete it. Uh, if it's somebody that maybe they're uh, not necessarily saying things in a tactful way, but they're making good points, you know, and you know, it might be, I don't like to read that criticism necessarily, but uh, nevertheless, you know, I feel like, well, they put some time into commenting and they're trying to make some points here. Maybe I should at least consider what the person has to say, even though they didn't say it in a very polite fashion. So I kind of try to walk that line. Uh, but, you know, of course, I would just say, think about yourself and what's going to work for you. Uh, if you decide to start blogging, give yourself a month to try it out, or a semester, as the case may be. All right, I think I, that will do it here uh, for this article. You know, hopefully you agree with uh, Alex, but maybe you don't like some of his points, or maybe you have a different uh, perspective on it, or maybe you have just questions about blogs that we really didn't get to here. Whatever the case may be, I'd love to hear from you. But I will stop it here, and see you next time.